There are many different types of aircraft being used in Southeast Alaska. Air commerce here is utilized the way the rest of the U.S. uses taxis, buses, and trucks. Helicopters and float planes are the most widely used aircraft. However, fixed gear and retractable gear aircraft are found in most Alaskan fleets. Be sure to monitor a local radio frequency at all times and make frequent position reports. It's important that you file a flight plan and stick to it. Then, if an emergency landing is imminent, the radio is already set to make a report. Be aware that several large air carriers land at Ketchikan, Wrangell, Petersburg, Sitka, Gustavus, and Juneau. Having good communication and keeping vigilant can save you from becoming a near mid-air collision or NMAC statistic. The vortices that are generated by these large aircraft can cause a smaller aircraft to be forced onto the runway during landing or departure. To avoid wake turbulence, try landing beyond the larger aircraft's touchdown point and take off prior to their rotation point. It's best to wait the recommended three to five minutes for wake turbulence abatement. If the tower does not make a recommendation for a wait for wake turbulence abatement, the pilot should make the request. While on cross-country flights, plot your course on the chart. Keep a close track of where you are at all times. It's easy for one inlet or bay to look very much like another. Pilotage is a skill that is alive and well in Alaska. Navigation aids are few and far between, and a GPS should only be used as a backup for the chart and pilotage. As a reminder, there are few GPS instrument approaches in Southeast Alaska at this time. Remember that alternating or flashing landing lights are unique to Alaska's aviation community. They are used to enhance visibility of aircraft in flight. A word of caution, remain within gliding distance of the shore when at all possible. The water is very cold, even in the summer. In the event of a forced water landing, the chances of survival are very slim due to hypothermia. Weather changes rapidly and often the changes are not forecast. Making a 180 degree turn and a precautionary landing at the first available landing area, even a beach, can save your life. Pilots often wait out bad weather at an outlying strip or beach. You should always be prepared to lay over until better weather arrives. If the wind is blowing, chances are the skies will be clear, but the ride bumpy. Wind can be seen on the water in the form of white caps. This indicates that the water could be too rough for landing a float plane. It's wise to call flight service prior to departure to see what the surface conditions will be at your intended airport destination. As the saying goes, if you don't like the weather here, just wait 10 minutes. Ketchikan is the first destination in Alaska for many travelers. Most pilots choosing to fly the inland waterway will depart from Washington State and fly over Prince Rupert, British Columbia to Ketchikan. The distance from Prince Rupert to Annette Island is 60 nautical miles and is over water most of the time. Victor Airway V309 is the shortest route and will cross Duke Island prior to reaching Annette Island VOR. Annette Island has a runway, however it is in disrepair and should not be used except in an emergency. The approach to Ketchikan is pretty straightforward from Annette VOR up Nichols Passage. Many float planes utilize the narrows between the airport and the town of Ketchikan. Large air carriers land at the Ketchikan airport and frequently approach from the VOR, so keep a heads up at all times. Ketchikan has a special rural area 
FAR 93 that all pilots must contact Ketchikan Flight Service Station for traffic advisory prior to and while departing the area. For that purpose, Ketchikan Flight Service Station acts much like a control tower with the exception of clearing a pilot to land or take off. It is still the pilot's responsibility to remain clear of other traffic at all times. The terrain surrounding Ketchikan Airport is steep and unforgiving. Off-airport landing areas are few or non-existent. Flight to Ketchikan on a good VFR day is easy enough. On an IFR weather day, avoiding the terrain is dependent upon good planning and IFR currency. VFR flight on marginal VFR days is discouraged. The NDB approach to runway 11 calls for a missed approach at the missed approach point. Executing the missed approach procedure prematurely could put you into the mountain that is right beside the runway. Study the terrain features carefully before flight into mountainous areas. Landing on runway 29 necessitates a back taxi to the taxiway. There is a road near to the approach end of 11 that looks as though it might be a taxiway. Don't attempt to taxi on that road. In poor weather or when a snowfall has obscured the slope down to the taxiway, a pilot could be deceived into thinking it was a shortcut to the ramp. If you are flying a float plane, you can land in the Tongass Narrows, which separates the town of Ketchikan and the airport. Traffic in the Tongass Narrows can become congested with boats, aircraft, cruise liners, personal watercraft, and the ferries that take visitors from the airport to town. Aircraft landing in the Narrows must have contact with Ketchikan Flight Service Station also and are expected to make contact prior to entering the Class E airspace. Fuel and tie-down space is available and flight service is located on the field for ease in getting weather and filing flight plans. The next stop on a trip northwest might be Wrangell, located on the northern tip of Wrangell Island. Wrangell is a small fishing community and is an airport of entry along the Inland Passage. The town is picturesque and quiet and has excellent fishing in the summer. Departing Ketchikan, Valner Point is a reporting point for incoming traffic to Ketchikan Airport, so remain to the right of the Tongass Narrows until well past the inbound traffic pattern. The best route to take would be up Clarence Strait, using Kamano Point as your first checkpoint. Following the strait to the northwest, remain to the right and close to shore. At Myers Chuck and Union Bay, turn right into Ernest Sound. There are many small inlets along this route of flight, so be sure to exercise your pilotage skills and keep close track of your position on your sectional. At the northwest end of Deer Island, you will need to turn left up Zamovia Strait around the west side of Wrangell Island. Should you continue into Ernest Sound, you will find yourself approaching Bradfield Canal. There is an inlet that is named Fool's Inlet to the left that could give a false illusion to a pilot of a route to Wrangell. Further on towards Bradfield Canal is Blake Channel. Blake Channel can be navigated, but is extremely bumpy in windy conditions and narrows at the outlet. If weather is marginal, you might find that you would not have the room to turn around.
The narrow channel does open into Eastern Passage, but is infrequently used as a route to Wrangell. The best route is to remain in Zamobia Strait, past Anita Bay and Waranofsky Island. There is a road to your right that will lead you to the town of Wrangell and around to the airport. Keep in mind that large air carriers land and take off from Wrangell Airport, flying over Caden Island at the approach end of runway 10. Other aircraft will fly left-hand traffic for runway 10 or right-hand traffic for runway 28. Fog often forms near the airport, so be sure to update your weather briefing before leaving for your trip. 1028 is a paved, lighted runway 6,000 feet long. Wrangell Harbor offers seaplane landing facilities. Fuel and tie downs are available at the airport, and you can walk to town about a mile from the airport. Petersburg is a small settlement located on Mitkoff Island, midway between Ketchikan and Juneau. It was founded by Norwegian fishermen. There is a Sons of Norway Hall and many fishing vessels in the harbor. Each spring a Norwegian festival is held and is a marvelous tourist attraction. If you intend to go to Petersburg for the festival, plan to make your reservations at least a year ahead. The town of Petersburg is one mile from the runway and can be walked to easily. Runway 422 is well maintained and lighted. Most facilities are available during the day, including aviation and jet fuel. The flight to Petersburg is short and fairly straightforward. After departing Wrangell, fly to the right of Caden Island and to the left of Sergiev Island through Dry Strait. Dry Island and Farm Island, which do not appear to be islands at all, will be off your right side. Once into Frederick Sound, Lacante Glacier and many calved icebergs can be seen ahead and to the right up Lacante Bay. Tour operators fly to Lacante Glacier in the summer months, so be alert to traffic flying in and out of the area. Frederick's Point NDB is on the left side just prior to reaching Petersburg. On VFR days, Alaska Airlines flies the short 10-minute flight from Wrangell to Petersburg at low altitudes, around 1,200 feet, up Frederick Sound. So keep your eyes open for large aircraft. Be aware that fog forms rather quickly, so get a good weather briefing before leaving for Petersburg or any other destination in southeast Alaska. Another route that is used to fly to and from Petersburg to Wrangell is the Wrangell Narrows. Alaska Airlines sometimes uses a low in route altitude down the Narrows when departing from runway 22. It is a picturesque route and fairly easy to follow with some planning. Departing Petersburg towards Wrangell, follow the road and power lines off your left past the power plant through a pass towards Sumner Strait. Once in Sumner Strait, bear left towards Rinda Island and past Caden Island to Wrangell Airport. To fly to Juneau, fly up Frederick Sound to the Stevens Passage, then north direct to Juneau.
Foxtrot, my family. Think it's 63 Foxtrot, right? You're clear to land. 63 Foxtrot. Most pilots arrive at Juneau from the southeast via Seattle and Ketchikan. Their flight path often takes them from Ketchikan to Petersburg and up the Stevens Passage to Juneau. The most important factors concerning this route are the lack of available emergency landing areas and the fact that the landmass takes on a sameness of features. Unless a pilot keeps close track of position and reports that position to the local flight service station, the chances of being found should the plane go down are slim. It is important that a flight plan is filed and followed when flying in southeast Alaska. As you approach Juneau, Admiralty Island will be off to your left and Snedisham to the right. A long series of power lines will be off to your right just prior to reaching Taku Inlet where they go underneath the water. The power lines re-emerge on the right side of Gastineau Channel and continue on to Juneau. Directly ahead, there will be three waterways. Taku Inlet will be to the right, Gastineau Channel in the center, and the lower portion of the Lynn Canal is to the left. Pilots have been known to mistake Taku Inlet or the Lynn Canal for Gastineau Channel. In order to avoid the congested area in the Gastineau Channel, it would be prudent to fly around the far side of Douglas Island to arrive at Juneau Airport. Upon reaching Marmion Island, bear left and fly the shoreline of Douglas Island up the northwest end of Stevens Passage to Outer Point. Bearing right, turn toward the Juneau Airport. Report outer point inbound with the current ATIS and proceed around the west end of Douglas Island to the appropriate runway. Flying up the Gastineau Channel, following the power lines to Juneau is a good pilotage technique. Progressing up the channel, you will see Marmion Island at the tip of Douglas Island to your left and Thane to the right. just prior to the Juneau-Douglas Bridge. You'll see the town of Douglas to the left and downtown Juneau to the right. There is a great deal of cruise ship activity in the Gastineau Channel in the summer months. Along with that ship activity comes tourists. Float plane operators will be conducting tours from the ships. In addition to float planes taking off and landing in the harbor, helicopter operators are conducting tours from the Era Heliport on Douglas and from the Juneau Airport. Since the advent of the tram downtown, paragliders have been launching from Mount Roberts, increasing air traffic in the downtown harbor area. Alaska Airlines is also using the Gastineau Channel for arrivals and departures. While in the area of the downtown harbor, prominent reporting points used by local traffic are the Rock Dump, Sheep Creek near Thane, and Mayflower Island off of Douglas. Approaching Juneau Airport, the bridge is a reporting point and the start of controlled airspace. Just north across the bridge and to the right in the harbor are the downtown transient float plane docks. The Douglas era heliport, Salmon Creek, and Vanderbilt Hill, a housing development on a hill to the right of and just prior to the airport, are also used as the final reporting points prior to touchdown at the airport. The Juneau Airport has a float pond landing area adjacent to the runway. The float pond is heavily utilized in the summer months. It is closed in the winter because it ices over and is unusable. Float pond traffic communicates with the tower for approach and departure. It is imperative that pilots taking off or landing on the float pond keep the tower and other traffic aware of their position and keep traffic in sight at all times.
Sitka is one of the most scenic and historically rewarding destinations to fly to. The airport has full facilities and hotels are nearby. The area surrounding Sitka is difficult terrain to navigate because there are numerous islands, bays and inlets that soon begin to look alike. Even well-seasoned pilots have been known to become disoriented in this area, so use your chart. Be sure to report to the Sitka Flight Service Station before entering the airspace when flying in reduced visibility. Departing Juneau towards Outer Point, fly south to Young Bay. Across the Mansfield Peninsula of Admiralty Island to Hawk Inlet. And down to Chatham Strait. Hawk Inlet, off the sisters' VOR 080 degree radial, is a good waypoint. Continuing down Chatham Strait, Freshwater Bay and Iokine Peninsula are prominent reporting points to the right. East across Chatham Strait from Freshwater Bay is a logging camp in Cube Cove. This is just one of many logging operations you will see in southeast Alaska. Tenneke Inlet, where the town of Tenneke Springs is located, is just beyond Freshwater Bay. The next really prominent checkpoint is Angoon on Admiralty Island on the east side of Chatham. The desired flight path should be to the west side of Chatham Strait. A right turn up Peril Strait will bring you past Catherine Island, which should be on your left as you fly up Peril Strait. As you progress up Peril Strait, Rodman Bay will be off to your left just before going around the Duffield Peninsula. Rodman Bay appears just before Atstoya Island. Atstoya Island is not named on the chart, but is one of two islands. Atstoya being the larger, located at the entrance to the south arm of Peril Strait. Follow the shoreline along Peril Strait after leaving Rodman Bay, past Dead Man's Reach, towards Fish Bay. As you can see, weather can change very quickly. We moved from overcast to rain and rime ice forming on the windshield in less than two minutes. This video was shot in August. After passing Fish Bay, continue down Salisbury Sound toward the open ocean. The next inlet to the left will take you around Partakshikov Island and direct to Sitka. One final checkpoint prior to landing is Middle Island. The Sitka Airport is located on Japonski Island, which is separated from the city by a one-quarter mile wide channel. The island is connected to the city by the O'Connell Bridge. Runway 1129 is 6,500 feet long, well-maintained and lighted. Again, to stress the effects of the weather on visibility, we are showing the same approach in both clear and rainy overcast weather. Be advised that there are Alaska Airlines approaches and departures at several times during the day and into the evening from Bjorka Island VOR. Prominent to the landscape is 3,200 foot Mount Edgecombe, a resting volcano to the west, as well as 3,200 foot Sugarloaf Mountain, directly ahead of the IFR Mist Approach Point. The IFR Mist Approach from the NDB, or VOR, located on Bjorka Island, can be especially interesting if you don't make the mist approach procedure at the mist approach point, you might impact the mountains, which are not too far from the runway. Float planes operate out of the Sitka Channel from O'Connell Bridge to the north end of Thompson Harbor. The takeoff and landing corridor is located on the southwest side of the anchorage, parallel to Japonski Island, running from the government pier where the U.S. Coast Guard cutter anchors out to the breakwater. You are reminded not to fly within 500 feet of any structures, including O'Connell Bridge, except as necessary for takeoff or landing. 
Pilots can land south of Sitka and taxi into the anchorage under the bridge, but must follow international navigation rules when operating as a vessel on the water. When departing Sitka northbound, it is recommended to follow the reverse of the demonstrated route. You can fly direct over the mountains, but you would need the power of at least a twin-engine plane to traverse the mountains with their variable weather and tricky wind currents. Following the reverse course back to Juneau, some of the more prominent checkpoints will include Fish Bay, Dead Man's Reach, Peril Strait, Catherine Island, as you leave Peril Strait and enter Chatham Strait. Tenneke Inlet. Hawk Inlet. Funter Bay, and final approach into Juneau Airport. The 70 nautical mile trip to Skagway from Juneau is fairly straightforward. One noteworthy item is the lack of beaches in the area. The slope of the mountains continues to the bottom of the canal, causing small rocky outcroppings in most areas. There are a couple of small dirt strips located at Glacier Point and Endicott on the west side and Katsahine on the east side. Flying up the Lynn Canal to Taya Inlet is the preferred route to Skagway. The Lynn Canal has several prominent reporting points that are used by the local operators and private pilots. After departing Juneau to the west, you should fly to the right side of Lynn Canal close to the land mass. Utilize the hemispheric rule for determining your flying altitude. The first prominent departure reporting points are Lena Point, Harbor, and Benjamin Island.
Next, you will approach Burners Bay, Bridget Point, and Echo Cove, which will be to the right. After passing Burners Bay, Point St. Mary's is the next reporting point. Keep in mind, Burners Bay is important as a reporting point. Most poor weather conditions for the Lynn Canal are generated in this area. Cadiabatic winds descending from the ice fields to the north of Burners Bay can create fog or turbulence depending on the temperature dew point spread. Tour operators will normally report Sherman Point on the other side of Burners Bay and Eldred Rock Lighthouse. Sullivan Island is to the left. The canal splits at this point, with Chilcat Inlet leading to Haines to the left, while Chilcoot Inlet bears right to Skagway. Continuing to follow the shoreline to the right, the canal splits again, forming Lutak Inlet to the left, which is a dead end. On the right is Taya Inlet, which takes you to Skagway. Once in Taya Inlet, report Taya Point and fly to the left side of the inlet to conform with prevailing traffic in the area. When approaching Skagway, be alert for tour operators in the area and for helicopter traffic departing and arriving at Skagway. The traffic pattern is at 1,000 feet with right-hand traffic for runway 19 to avoid the town of Skagway. It will appear that the pattern is close to the mountain, and it is. You will find that you are quite close to the trees on the downwind. A close-in base turn around the water tanks to almost immediate final is needed to avoid overshooting the final approach. This is a tight, narrow canyon that consistently generates turbulent winds in the pattern and on the runway. Be aware that there is a bridge with automobile and truck traffic at the end of the final approach end for runway 19. The bridge is used as a final reporting point. There's a school to the left of the runway just beyond the bridge that must not be overflown. Since the runway is narrow and 3,700 feet long, it gives the appearance that you must land on the approach end numbers in order to stop by the end of the runway. Touching down in the first third of the runway is paramount. Also, be alert to the possibility of variable winds on the runway. Tour operations generated by the cruise ship industry in the summer are extremely busy conducting glacier tours. Multiple flights depart and arrive at the same time, making pattern entry awkward. Good communications are the key to safe entry as well as departure. After landing, aircraft taxi off to the side of the runway and wait for other landing aircraft to taxi off before taxiing back to parking.
be aware that several aircraft are apt to be back taxiing to parking areas at one time. So it's important to be especially careful to report your position in the pattern and while on final. When necessary, don't hesitate to go around. Wind shifts are common in Skagway. It's not unusual to see all three wind socks flying in different directions at the same time. The winds are known to shift unexpectedly. It is possible to get a reported wind from the south only to be on final approach to runway 19 and have the wind suddenly come down the valley from the north. Winds are usually from the south at 17 to 25 knots, but have been known to exceed 30 knots in the summer. In winter months, severe winds can ground aircraft for days at a time. from Skagway to Juneau off runway 19. After clearing the shoreline, turn to fly to the left of Taya Inlet and retrace your steps to Lena Point. Your first checkpoint on the return trip will be Taya Point. As you enter the Lynn Canal, you can see the Chilcat Inlet off to your right, which leads to Haynes. Your next set of checkpoints will be Sullivan Island to your right and Eldred Rock Lighthouse. As you continue toward Juneau, you will see Burners Bay, Benjamin Island, Eagle Beach, Tea Harbor, and finally, Lena Point. Lena Point is the first reporting point into the Juneau Airport. The approach into Juneau requires vigilance because many aircraft will be approaching and departing the Juneau Airport and float pond area. Subsequent reporting points when approaching for runway 08 are Coglin Island, then Battleship Island, if requested, the cut, south tip, and final approach. The 60 nautical mile trip to Haines from Juneau is fairly straightforward. One noteworthy item is the lack of beaches in the area. The slope of the mountains continues to the bottom of the canal, causing small rocky outcroppings in most areas. Flying up the Lynn Canal to Chilcat Inlet is the preferred route to Haines. The Lynn Canal has several prominent reporting points that are used by the local operators and private pilots. After departing Juneau to the west, you should fly to the right side of Lynn Canal close to the land mass. Utilize the hemispheric rule for determining your flying altitude. The first prominent departure reporting points are Lena Point, T. 
Tea Harbor, Eagle Beach and Benjamin Island. Next, you will approach Burners Bay, Bridget Point, and Echo Cove, which will be to the right. After passing Burners Bay, Point St. Mary's is the next reporting point. Keep in mind, Burners Bay is important as a reporting point. Most poor weather conditions for the Lynn Canal are generated in this area. Cadiabatic winds descending from the ice fields to the north of Burners Bay can create fog or turbulence depending on the temperature dew point spread. Tour operators will normally report Sherman Point on the other side of Burners Bay and Eldred Rock Lighthouse. Sullivan Island is to the left. In the vicinity of Eldred Rock, pilots frequently cross the Lynn Canal towards Sullivan Island to fly up the Chilcat Inlet to Haines. When crossing the canal, remain within gliding distance of shore. Haines Peninsula separates Chilcat Inlet to the left from Chilcoot Inlet to the right. There is a landing strip at Glacier Point at the foot of Davidson Glacier that can be used in an emergency. Davidson Glacier, which will be off to the left, is a route used by the tour operators into Glacier Bay. It is also a reporting point that has a lot of traffic during the summer months. Continuing towards Haines, Rainbow Glacier, which is a hanging glacier to the left of your flight path, is also used as a reporting point. Alexander Island is just a beam Davidson Glacier and Pyramid Rock, just before reaching the city of Haines. Both are reporting points for entering the traffic pattern at Haines. Haines has quite a bit of traffic in the summer months. Tour operators pick up tourists for glacier tours. Haines has one of the few roads in southeast Alaska that connects to the Alcan Highway. The Alaska Marine Highway, or ferry, stops in Haines with potential passengers from outlying areas. Operators based in Haines serve the local population and ferry passengers with transportation in southeast Alaska to areas where there are no roads or ferry service. 
Weather can change rapidly and high winds blowing across the runway are common. There is a bluff to the northwest of runway 826. There are strong crosswinds due to wind descending over the bluff. Moose and bear are known to be in the vicinity of the runway, so be cautious on the approach. There is transient parking available, but services are limited. Fuel can be obtained by calling the phone number listed at the pumps. When departing Haines, avoid flying over the town at low altitudes. The people of Haines are very noise sensitive. 135 operators will be reporting the Davidson Glacier descending inbound to Haines. Be especially aware of traffic around you as you climb out. Returning to the Lynn Canal, you will again pass Pyramid Rock, Alexander Island, Davidson Glacier, and Rainbow Glacier. As you move out of Chilcat Inlet into the Lynn Canal, your next set of checkpoints will be Sullivan Island and Eldred Rock Lighthouse. As you continue toward Juneau, you will see Burners Bay, Benjamin Island, Eagle Beach, Tea Harbor, and finally, Lena Point. It is important that you know where the reporting points are located in order to spot reporting traffic in the Lynn Canal. Alaska Airlines VFR descent is across Barlow Cove to the Cut or Funter Bay to South Tip. Be alert to traffic arriving from the southwest. Lena Point is the first reporting point into the Juneau Airport. The approach into Juneau requires vigilance because many aircraft will be approaching and departing the Juneau Airport and float pond area. Subsequent reporting points when approaching for runway 08 are Coglin Island, then Battleship Island, if requested, the cut, south tip, and final approach. Gustavus is a popular airport because of its proximity to Glacier Bay Park and campgrounds. Tour operators conduct Glacier Bay tours from Gustavus Airport. There is wildlife in the vicinity of Gustavus Airport. Bear have been known to transit the runway from time to time. There is a cabin near the airport and the occupant transits the runway periodically. So be ready for a possible go around. On departure from Juneau Airport, depart westbound towards Barlow Cove at the north end of Admiralty Island or Funter Bay. The next reporting point en route to Gustavus will be the Coverden Islands towards Icy Straits. Be aware that jet traffic can exist over the area of Coverden. Sisters Island VOR will be located off to your left. Sisters is an approach fix for Gustavus IFR traffic. Continuing flight up icy straits will bring you to Excursion Inlet to your right and Porpoise Islands and Pleasant Island. Pleasant Island is the final reporting point for landing at Gustavus. Gustavus has two runways, 0119 and 1028. At 6,700 feet long, runway 1028 is the longest and widest runway and is used by small aircraft as well as Alaska Airlines. Runway 0119 is closed from the time the Alaska Airlines jet aircraft is at the final approach fix to Gustavus until 15 minutes after departure of the Alaska Airlines aircraft. Alaska Airlines parks at the terminal, taking up most of the available runway and ramp at that location. 
Transient parking is located at the approach end of runway 01, and fuel is available with the use of a credit card. Departing from runway 19, you will cross a noise-sensitive area consisting of several homes and businesses. Be neighbor-friendly. Departing runway 10, left hand traffic is suggested. Depart downwind, then direct to Pleasant Island. Returning to Juno, the reporting points remain the same. Report Portland Island, the beginning of Class D airspace, or George's Rock. The reporting points near the airport remain the same as returning from Haines or Skagway.